After singing that song, I need a while to get my breath, be able to speak. That's a good song to lose your breath over. When the Hebrew children departed Egypt, there was a multitude of Gentiles of various races and tribes that went with them. It's easy to overlook that fact, but it has great bearing on some things that happened later. We think sometimes that the children of Israel were the only slaves the Egyptians had, but we learn that's not the case. These Gentiles, not being Hebrews, uh, took an opportunity to depart with them. It was a great time to escape. They didn't know much about, as an Israelite would, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and those promises made to them. They may have heard about it some from the Israelites. They certainly would have heard something, but we don't know what about Joseph. But they would not have had the connection at all and to any depth as to Joseph's arriving, arriving in Egypt many years before, doing the things that he did. No reason to believe that they cared very much about the covenant and promises God made to those Hebrew patriarchs I just remembered. And they would have had little to no involvement or knowledge of the worship of God. We might say, as I said a moment ago, they, they saw an opportunity for freedom and they grabbed it. As Moses led that great host of pilgrims across a very hostile wilderness, you remember that the people murmured and complained. They even rebelled against Moses. And among those who did that were those called the mixed multitude. Listen to what is written by Moses himself in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 46. And the mixed multitude that was among them lusted exceedingly. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic and the Listerine. Not it, that's not there. But now, I'll, I'll just see if you're listening. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all save this manna. Now, in Hebrew, manna means what is it? And we used to play a joke on that, say manna. Say, what is it? Well, that's what he meant. What is it? When they saw that manna as we know it, they said, manna, what is it? So uh, we just have this manna. Well, that was a miracle. It was applied to them to give them bread. But now my point being here is that the mixed multitude was very much involved in that. And it was really bothering and upsetting and did not help at all the Israelites be what God expected them to be. Is there a lesson here for us today in spiritual Israel? Well, I think so. All these things were written not just to give us history, but to teach us about things that happen in spiritual Israel, the Lord's church today. Today I fear greatly that there's always been, and I guess sometimes a lot more than others, at, a, at times more than others, a mixed multitude of the Lord's church. Some in God's house, for lack of a better way to refer to it, have at least outwardly obeyed the gospel of Christ. Maybe some actually obeyed Romans 6, 17, and 18. But that's just about all they were. They, they died in their infancy spiritual infancy. They found their way to the church through their parents who were members. 
They grew up going to uh, Church of Christ. That's all they ever knew. They were baptized as children. Really wasn't much of a conversion to it. It was not out of faith and the convictions of their faith that brought them into the church, as it ought to be and as it must be if you're really going to be baptized into Christ, be added to the church and be a faithful child of God. There were other kids their age who were being baptized. And they knew they were expected to be. And Mom and Dad thought they ought to be, and so they did. That's one way that you get a mixed multitude in the church that's uh, not really converted to Christ. Others came into connection with the Lord's church through marriage or because they were attracted to a personable preacher. Preacher Alice has always been around. Uh, there have been some who were drawn because of community involvement of ball teams or Maybe they were in addiction recovery classes. and Maybe they met at the church building, as sometimes happens. They came, and they made friends. They found pleasant surroundings, and they stayed. They were baptized to join, but not much teaching preceded that baptism nor were they convinced like they ought to be, and therefore they couldn't be very well convicted of their sins and convicted of their sins by the truth. Others of that mixed multitude came from denominational churches, and since they had gone through something they called baptism when they joined whatever that church might have been, brethren... Uh, accepted them on that basis without further instruction. So they brought a lot of baggage with them from the denominational world. Some, of course, came to the church with proper instruction concerning every step in the plan of salvation, including baptism. But they didn't know a whole lot about the church, its worship, and so on, its organization. They were never grounded in what we may say the doctrine of Christ that we talked about this morning, Second John 9 through 11. They remained at what we might say at the entrance level of knowledge, forever novices in the faith. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 2. So their thinking still continued to have many faulty views from their prior religious experience, what education and those things they had, and the culture all around them, because evil companionships always corrupts good morals. There were those who really started well. They were properly taught thereby through the gospel introduced to the church, the body of Christ. They went to schools operated by the brethren and had a good education and Christian environment. They had Christian teachers and they were with their peers who were like them. Tragically, while there, there were those teachers who over the years seemed to be like a magnet uh, drawn to such schools. They no longer taught the truth. They themselves had become unfaithful. And there were many things that they did and taught that filled those students with doubts about the church and about the doctrine of Christ, about the faith, the importance of authority the pattern of which we talked about this morning, to the outright denial that there is a New Testament pattern. Thus, many people who went to those schools and parents thought, well, they'll come out stronger, came out crippled. Crippled in their spirituality, crippled in their faith. 
Others were much even worse than that. They were just totally corrupted. and They abandoned Christ altogether and went into some other kind of religion, maybe not even connected with anything to do with Christ or the Bible. Others in our modern-day mixed multitude started out well, too. They heard, they understood, they obeyed the gospel of our Lord. And they had a, a zeal to preach the gospel and to teach. And they wanted to do it in a school operated by the brethren. And thus they sought to qualify for that by going to higher education and other places to get graduate degrees. So they enrolled in secular schools or denominational schools and they had their faith undermined, just virtually brainwashed and poisoned against simple New Testament Christianity. Rather than leave the church, because that's what they were used to, not because they were convicted that they should not, then they stayed with the membership. Many of them just occupied a pew. That's about all. But some saw fit to teach the error that they had heard. And they were dangerous and harmful as they sought to teach their defective views of Scripture. And worship in the church and how to be a Christian. Who a Christian is and fellowship and so forth. From this mixed multitude to this present hour, we're hearing a clamorous call for all kind of changes in the church. In many places, that, that change has come. They are Church of Christ in name only. So, like those of the mixed multitude in Moses' day, they long for the things of this world and for religion that is devised by this world. And so you see things like, well, we have our mistakes. Do you claim to be perfect? Do you claim to be sinless? Well, they don't either. They don't claim to be. They believe in God. They believe in the Bible. They believe in Christ. They assemble to worship. So why is it that we don't have fellowship with them? And so you begin to think of yourself and the church of which you are a part, though it has Church of Christ on the marquee, just another denomination. And all the identifying marks that are in the doctrine of Christ begin to be belittled. And finally, even the doctrine of Christ itself is said not to be a pattern, is said not to be a blueprint. In fact, uh, it's not even there for us to hold to like would a, a pattern to make a dress or a suit or blueprint to build a building. It's just some sort of narrative that declares God's love to us and that God loves us so much he gave his son and we will just accept Christ as our personal savior. That's all we can do because none of us can be perfect anyway. And thus, why should we think that we're the only ones that are right? They want to accept people on faith alone. It rubs them really the wrong way at the idea of God's word being the law of the kingdom or that there's any law at all governing the kingdom, Galatians 6 and 2. They want it all grace, although they'll say we're saved by grace alone and faith alone, <laughs> which makes, as far as I know, one in one makes two, but that's the way they'll say it, which means they've adopted the denominational world's viewpoint of things. Thus, in following the ways of the world, the religious world that's founded upon the commandments and doctrines of men, they go further and further away, and they insist that women have leadership roles in the Lord's church, and they grow weary of Bible-based worship, they demand excitement and they demand parties and they demand all kind of 
frivolous things to entertain them. They want solos and they want singing groups and they want choirs and the like. Really, they want performance rather than preaching. They're looking for acceptance by the world and they really can't stand being separate and different from the world or anybody else that says Jesus is Lord. They want the church to change so that she will be acceptable to her religious bodies around her. They murmur, they complain, they outright oppose preachers and elders who will not join them in their zeal in the quest to change the faith, the worship that's set out in the New Testament. Even the approach to ascertaining the authority of the Lord they claim to love so they can act only as he directs them. And thus they lump everything into what I like and you like. After all, this is 2023. How can we tell people to go back 2,000 years and worship? The mixed multitude with Moses lusted for those pleasant things of Egypt. They wanted to go back. They forgot about the fact they were slaves. They wanted to go back and enjoy them. Our mixed multitude are willing to cast aside the freedom they have in Jesus Christ and the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, and go back into the spiritual change of denominationalism that men sacrificed greatly about 200 years ago to leave and to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. Moses' mixed multitude proved themselves unworthy of the opportunity that God had given them. For they could have decided to embrace what was given to the Jews. There had been those that did that. They were a source of constant agitation within the camp of Israel. And our mixed multitude in spiritual Israel are of the same spirit. They are not content with following the same old Jerusalem gospel. They look for something new constantly. Now, we're not opposed to things that are new if they're more expedient in delivering that same old Jerusalem gospel. If you go back 100 years ago and a little further, you wouldn't find, even in a lot of places still, a PA system. Certainly wouldn't find a lot of air conditioning unless you raised the wind and had a funeral fan. Babies were putting pallets on the floor. So we knew enough to hold to the obligatory matters that makes the church the Lord's church and still embrace PA systems and air conditioning and all these other technological advantages that we've got. But those are just aids. They're just things whereby we use them to spread the truth that never changes. But there are a lot of folks who don't want to see that. They muddy the waters and they make, don't make a difference between obligatory matters that cannot be changed, the truth, and in those things that can be changed to better get out the truth and even defend the faith. But if you have an accurate study, which the church ought to do, of the final authority of the New Testament, how the New Testament authorizes how we as human beings are expected to study it in the right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15, then you learn to tell the difference. To me, it shouldn't be that hard. Every verse in the Bible concerning the music we're to use to worship God has singing in it. And we learned a long time ago, anything that helps me just discharge that obligation. Singing is an aid Thus, we know that we can have a songbook because it's not another kind of music. It's just an aid to discharging the obligation to sing when it comes to worshiping God in music. There's only two kinds of music, mechanical and instrumental, 
And singing, the Bible said singing. Is that difficult? No, it's not. When it comes to baptism, baptism in the very root of the word means to plunge and to bury, to immerse. But then you don't even have to know the Greek. Just read Romans 6, 3 and 4 and Colossians 2, 12. And it talks about burying somebody in baptism. So when somebody says, what about sprinkling water on them or pouring water on them? Well, if you just take the word of God, it's a burial. And it's a burial of a person who's believed in Christ and repented of their sins and confessed their faith in Christ. And they're baptized in order to be forgiven of their sins, not because their sins are already forgiven. Well, the scriptures are clear on that. It just comes down finally to where we don't want to hear it. We want to be acceptable to other people. And there's plenty of denominations all around us. In fact, most of them who don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved, don't believe that it's a burial in water and all of those things. But there's something about the mixed multitude as it rubs off because remember evil companionship corrupts good morals and that mixed multitude had an impact on the children of Israel, fleshly Israel, in a bad way and so it is with us today. As I go back over my life and I look at the churches where I've been and know of other preachers and their work, faithful preachers, and I see the problems that have been caused by members of the church. I'm not talking about people outside the church trying to destroy it. I'm talking about members of the church who through their ignorance and rebelliousness and whatever have sought to disrupt the primitive plan of New Testament Christianity. And they're contentious with it. They're not happy. They're always stirring the kettle, if you please. These are the mixed multitude. You have to finally come down to this and ask yourself, am I more like the mixed multitude or am I one of those that's truly convicted by the truth to be what the New Testament defines to be a Christian, a member of the Lord's church, faithful, knowing the difference between what's obligatory and what's not? Am I content with things as they're revealed in the New Testament? And only those who truly love Christ and His Word and His church have a place among the Israel of God. God knows our heart. I'm quite sure there are certain ones who, as far as we can see, have been baptized to Christ. We, as far as humans, not knowing their minds, not knowing why they did what they did, we, of course, should assume the best and think they're Christians. But God who knows their hearts, Jesus who does the adding, they may have gone through all of that, but yet Jesus knows they didn't obey from the heart. And they may be on some church roll somewhere, but he never recorded their name in the book of life because they were never truly from the heart obedient to the gospel. Remember the situation in Jerusalem, the first sin that appeared, Ananias and Sapphira? I said this a few Sundays ago, or not long ago anyway, that we would have no way to know that Ananias and Sapphira we're not fine, upstanding, faithful Christians if God had revealed, the searcher of the hearts had not revealed to Peter what they did. So what they appeared on the surface to be, they were not. And God, through Peter, pulled out before them exactly what they did. They conspired between one another and they lied about things. Now what was God's attitude about it? Well, they killed him on the spot. God means business. Have you ever noticed the effect that had upon not only the church, but everybody that heard those things? They were fearful. Christianity is not anything to play with. You don't just pretend to be a part of it. God knows. And God will deal with it. Just because he doesn't deal with it. The moment we do our sins, aren't we glad? But we'll deal with it on the day of judgment and all the secrets of men are known. Doesn't mean he won't deal with it, for he will. 
we just have his great grace and mercy and long suffering extended to us now to determine whether we're really for him. We're really on his side. We're really walking the straight and narrow way of truth. And we're seeking to grow in the knowledge of that truth. So unless this mixed multitude is willing to submit to the Lordship and the authority of Jesus Christ, we would all be better off if they left us and returned to spiritual Egypt and the slavery that's there. One of the problems in the Lord's church over the years that has stood out to me, and I know it's not only me, has been how people will do all they can to keep somebody in a pew. Sometimes that person doesn't even want to be there. But a person who's a troublemaker. Who's a troublemaker as far as God is concerned? The one who will not submit to all of the commandments of God. Now, the world may call us troublemakers because we say we're not bending the right hand or the left. We're going to do just what God said, and that's all. Well, that's the way you're faithful. I love what the late Bill Jackson used to say about things like that. He said, there's times you just have to be stubborn with the truth. The world doesn't like that. And many of my soft soap brethren at times don't either, and that's the reason the church slides away. Maybe it starts off as a bit of a trickle, but before it's over with, it's a rushing Niagara Falls because every little bit you depart from gets easier to depart from something else. So we must be vigilant. We must be determined. And it begins right here in my life. Me taking inventory of myself honestly and objectively in the light of a rightly divided word. And being willing then to change whatever needs to be changed to be right with God. Our life on earth, and I'll close here, is to show God we want to be right with Him. That He knows best. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. And we know and are sure that thou art the Son of God. Unless we truly from the heart can make that statement based upon the conviction of the truth that we have, we need to do some serious thinking about our lives and what keeps us where we are and makes us what we are. If you're not a child of God, we've studied in this sermon already how to become one. As a child of God, if you've wandered from the straight and narrow way, we urge you to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Whatever your spiritual need is, we invite you at this time then to come while we stand and sing.